What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. We are going to be talking about the human heart today. We're going to be talking about this amazing organ inside of us that helps keep us alive, a major pillar of the human body. And sitting down with us is cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Amit Sheik. Hello. Hey, Alan. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on to our show. It's really awesome. Appreciate oh, it's it. an honor. And I've been blessed to have met you and be learning from you and just even have you in in my life because it's so important to know someone that knows about the human heart and what's going on inside of this machine. Well, you're very kind. Thank you for that. But uh, it's been a pleasure and obviously the feeling's mutual. Everything you're doing here at Simulation Series and your passion about education and bringing um, knowledge to the masses is so wonderful, such a great uh, mission, such a great vision. I'm just glad I can be, you know, play a little part in that, uh, that process. You, I think we have a lot of love for each other, which is awesome and so important in, in relationships. So that's so great. And let's, let's do this, let's talk about this. I mean, you've, how long have you been practicing and you're now at Kaiser. I am. I'm at Kaiser San Francisco. I'm a practicing uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, but really uh, I focus mainly on heart surgery, uh, diseases that uh, can be surgically corrected that affect the heart. Um, <clears throat> I'm very lucky in that I am passionate about heart surgery and diseases of the heart and cardiovascular physiology, and I've been able to find uh, a place where I can practice focused on, on those things. And you, I think, what did you tell me that there's like, like four hearts per week or is it eight hearts per week that you're? Well, different, well, there's, you know, d different hospitals have different volumes of uh, pure heart surgical procedures that they perform. Uh, we do uh, about uh, a thousand heart surgery procedures a year. Uh, and wow. so there, you can do the math. I mean, that's three a day. Uh, well, at least m more than more than that. Yeah. So you know, it's it's about uh, about you know four four cases to five cases a, a day. Uh, and you're it, doing one of those. Well, all the surgeons have a have a caseload on on average people are operating about four, four times a week, four cases a week. Four cases a week. Yeah. Man. And some are some, some, sometimes more, sometimes less. And the human heart's usually plagued by heart disease or some sort of an issue that needs attention. Let's start showing maybe some of our slides and keep walking sure. us through. Um, let's, let's start from, let's start from the top. So, um, you know, after this one, you showed us that you, know, you kind of give us a very next next one, Ronnie. We right, talked so we can, about your. We can skip skin. that. Yep. We've got. So, uh, really, what what do cardiothoracic surgeons do? Um, and we uh, use operative techniques to treat organs in in the chest cavity. So, that's the heart, the lungs, the airway, the esophagus, um, and again. You know, <clears throat> while some surgeons uh, have a more broad practice, they do uh, everything. Uh, oftentimes, you'll find a, a certain surgeons focus either in thoracic surgery, that's diseases of the lungs, the airway, the esophagus, uh, a lot of uh, cancer operations done for those organs. Yep. And uh, the, the other kind of big school of cardiothoracic surgeons are the ones that focus on more heart uh, surgeries. So uh, diseases that involve, for example, atherosclerosis, where you have to do bypass operations on the heart, replacing or repairing valves, and then working on the great vessels, and those are the big arteries that come out of the heart and feed uh, the yeah. brain and the body. So that's, that's really what, what a heart surgeon does. Yeah, so, so esophagus and lungs can usually be plagued by a cancer, yes. and then the heart's usually a disease, disease 
there are usually underlying disease processes that result in structural deterioration of the heart and its components, yep. which then need a structural solution. In other words, yeah. if you imagine the arteries of the heart are pipes carrying blood and the arteries are getting clogged, you either need to, you know, to go in there and open up the artery with a stent Oof. or you need to create a new conduit surgically yeah. um, and bypass that artery altogether. So that's a structural solution to a structural problem. And these are temporary solutions, a stent, will last you for a, it'll help you get through the next couple of years but another piece of the body could fall apart at that and then sure yeah. i mean m most structural interventions in medicine are things that you're doing to treat a disease that is far progressed the yeah. holy grail of course would be to identify why that perturbance happens yes and arrest that <clears throat> early on in development or identify how you could treat it i mean it'd be you know, in some ways it would be great if you could just take a pill and not have any more heart disease. Yeah, and right. if we can get to a point where we're identifying the, the, right. the, the, the slow degradation of the body over time and we can intervene and repair Correct. along the way. Um, okay, so uh, we'll, let's continue expanding. We'll go to the next one. Yeah, we talked about the two distinct focuses, the heart and the other structures. In so the thoracic structures are the esophagus and the lungs? Well, the heart is a thoracic structure. As well. But um, the, way that the, the way the surgical field has kind but of evolved. But the lungs and the esophagus are not cardiac structures. Right. Yeah. right. Cardiac refers to just to heart, the heart. And thoracic refers to everything in the chest yes. cavity. Yes. Okay. So then um, anything to do with uh, ribs as well mm -hmm. and sternum. Yeah. This, so bony. Uh, issues involving the ribs are usually handled by people who have more of a thoracic focus. Yeah. Um, but again, people who are cardiothoracic have been trained in both. It's just that they mm -hmm. may specialize in one area yeah. or another. Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll go to the next one. So I think the heart is an amazing organ. Uh, you know, obviously it's captivated my imagination from a very young age. 100,000 um, beats per day. Yeah. And... Uh, it's a organ that it it's a very interesting organ it's a pump it's a biological pump basically in its most basic format yeah however it's a very complex pump it's a pump that can regulate itself that can respond to physiologic and psychologic stimuli uh, and it's a pump that has many components that help it to function it has valves to ensure that blood flows in the appropriate direction. It has blood vessels that feed the cells of the pump to keep it alive and to take away waste of the cells as any organ would. Yep. Uh, it, it has a, a rigid skeleton around which all these semi-rigid cells have grown and created the ultra structure of the heart and on top of all of that it has its own electrical yes uh intrinsic pacemaker yes. with relay stations and specialized fibers that um, help coordinate electrical signals so that it's an organized uh, kind of contraction of the heart that allows blood to flow in a very smooth laminar fashion to where it needs to go. How do we tap into the energy that powers the heart? That free energy that powers the heart, where do we get that energy so that we can use it to power our homes <laughs> and our devices? Come well, on I, now. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the adage of there's no such thing as a free lunch is true. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's not true free energy. It's energy that's generated as most electrical impulses in the body are generated uh, you eat uh, you know we're all kind of solar powered at the end of the day we're all solar powered because uh, the Sun is providing energy that is allowing us to grow food yeah. uh, and then we are then taking that food in releasing the uh, energy that's stored in the food and using that to 
basically create little batteries in each cell by setting up a differential in ions across cell membranes and that potential then <clears throat> is harnessed to create electrical impulses which then go on to uh, you know generate various physiologic processes and that's in the body. how the heart actually biologically does the pumping well the heart does the heart does the pumping uh, because it is created like any other muscle in in the body in that it has uh, you know filaments that interact with each other uh, there, there are these molecules known as actin and myosin and there's a set of biochemical reactions that happen uh, that allow those filaments to work with one another to tighten and then another set of reactions that happen to allow those filaments to slide apart from one another yeah. and relax yeah. and those contraction cycles are dependent on the availability of uh, energy stored uh, in, in molecules with fancy names uh, that we could talk about for hours and hours. It makes me so grateful to understand the heart better and as you unpack it more I just become more grateful for th what is inside of me that provides me with life. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's a wonderful sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are what are some other ones that are very important here? So what uh, so the heart pumps about five liters a minute, five quarts of blood about a, a, a minute. minute. Yeah, that's uh, how much Damn. on average the heart is pumping out over really miles and miles of, of blood vessels that are uh, compacted and shrunk down in your body and feed all the organs uh, 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 that are within you. And this is the oxygenation cycle. Well, the, well, it's the, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a closed system in some ways, the blood is, um, but it, your body interacts w with the world. So yes, it, you're taking in oxygen from the outside um, and the heart is pumping blood so that it can get oxygen and release CO2, uh, which is a byproduct of uh, metabolism, which all the cells create in your body. And so we bring the oxygen through the red blood cells to the parts of the body and then the CO2 is the byproduct that comes out and then takes the waste out from, yes. the, from the metabolism process across yeah. the body. And so your heart actually if you look from an evolutionary standpoint it's very efficient. It's pumping every time it squeezes it's actually sending blood in two separate parallel circuits. Not serial but parallel. And those two parallel circuits are one circuit is responsible for sending blood to the lungs allowing the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide to happen and that blood then comes back and goes into the other circuit which is sending the oxygenated blood and CO2 deprived blood or cl cleansed blood to the rest of the body. We have a graphic for this one, right? Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah, we yeah. do. Let's, let's go to... Let's we can talk a little more about it. Um, well, these are some just some neat fun facts. So people often say that an adult heart is about the size of a fist. It's kind of about the size of a fist and a half. Fist and a half. You yeah. know, and uh, in various disease processes, it can even, the heart can get really big. But you probably have about a, a fist and a half size heart in your chest. It doesn't really sit, um, you know, all the way over in the left. It, it sits in the center and then kind slightly. of slightly goes over into the left. Yeah, but um, it, it leans left. Yeah, and it's important. The heart <laughs> leans to the left. Yes, it does. Uh, and on average, it, the, your heart rate is somewhere between you know sixty to a uh, hundred. A hundred's considered fast. So most people sit between sixty and, and eighty uh, for their heartbeat. Yep. And you have a um, the heart itself has chambers. There's actually we already talked that there are two parallel circuits, but um, beyond that, there are um, the workhorses of the heart, the ventricles. Uh -huh. They are the ones that pump the blood to either the the lungs or the or the body, the left 
heart, the left ventricle pumps to the body, the right ventricle pumps to the lungs. lungs. And then these um, are the two largest chambers. Those are the two lungs. larger chambers that are kind of, they make the, they make up the, the, the bulk portion, the bottom, the, the bulk, bottom, the, the bulk. bulk bottom. Yeah. Okay. It's hard to use terms like top and the bottom <laughs> and the heart because the, the heart's kind of situated in an axis that's front to back. Uh, um, but if you think about the way blood enters the heart, the first chambers it so the aorta enters, the, the large um, ventricles are not always on top on the towards your like neck are they no they are not no always. we should look at a picture let's of a do heart it. let's let's do um, it. and we can talk a little bit so here okay. you have um, so it's usually a like schematic kind of like off like this like the axis looks like it's like this yeah it's sitting in the in the chest uh, where this this is the apex of the heart and that's kind of if you looked on yourself, it'd be sitting right about here. Ah, okay. Uh, and okay. and the oh, so it's angled. So the so the axis of the like the aorta is angled towards here. Towards well, the, here. the axis of the heart is like this. The aorta yeah. actually comes up and curves this way. Uh huh. All right. Okay. And so, uh, the the chamber of the heart that kind of faces the world is actually the right ventricle. That's in the ah, front. Okay. And. The left ventricle sits more t posteriorly. Okay. Okay. And the atrium, right, just like an atrium of a house, those are the little chambers on top of each ventricle that first receive the blood and then squeeze it into the ventricle. Uh -huh. That kind of little extra squeeze primes that ventricle, gives it even a little more oomph, so it fills up like a spring and then squeezes down and sends the blood where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. So on the right side, the body will take all the blood that's deoxygenated and it'll come into the right ventricle, uh, excuse me, the right atrium. The right atrium will squeeze that into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will sque squeeze that into the lungs. Mm -hmm. The oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange will happen, okay? And then <clears throat> the blood will come back to the left atrium the left atrium will squeeze and that will go into the left ventricle and the left mm -hmm. ventricle will then squeeze that oxygenated blood all Through the way the into your body and the cycle will continue. And this is a different set of veins for each one of these two. Veins are structures that bring blood back to the heart yeah. and arteries are structures that carry it away. Okay, mm -hmm. veins bring the blood away, back. back to the heart. Yes. Arteries bring oxygen to and blood to the body. And Arteries, veins. not necessarily. Okay. The way to think about it is heart-centric. Veins okay. drain into the veins drain in uh -huh. into the uh, heart, and arteries lead away from away the heart. from the heart. Okay, right. And the, these so two com, two again these different um, uh, veins and arteries. So they're correct. made for a purpose in the body. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Because if you think about it, now we're going to get um, a little a little deeper that, here. Okay. If you think about it. Veins that are coming from the lungs, the pulmonary veins, are bringing oxygenated blood to the heart. Mm. They're the only veins that'll oh, do yeah, that, right? Yeah, that's right. right. Interesting. And, and pulmonary arteries or arteries leading to the lungs are actually taking deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle and taking it to get oxygenated. So it's not as simple, simple as, as that, yeah. you know, yeah, that's cool. as which is it oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. The way to think about it is the heart, heart centric, yeah. centric, right? Yeah, yeah. It's easy for me. I love the heart, so it's got to yeah, be heart centric. Heart centric, centric yeah. So veins yeah. are uh, vessels that kind of bring things to the heart, and arteries are vessels that carry it away. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So, lub dub. What are the the heart sounds, right? The, the lub dub. This is your lub dub. This is yeah. This is the stethoscope when you put the stethoscope. Yeah, or up. you put your ear on someone's it's chest as they did before. Yeah, which you know. Lub dub, lub dub, lub -dub. lub dub. The two heart sounds. Lub dub. I I, I really uh, love like uh, in my like past relationships. That was one of my like favorite things to do. Sure. Would be to just you know to just yeah. be like just you know sit still for a second, and yeah. then I would just put my ear right on the heart and just listen and it would just sound so amazing to listen it, it is and yeah. not to we gotta take our time to just listen like that to absolutely the heart. It's absolutely so beautiful um well you know still despite all the modern advances in imaging and um 
you know, diagnostic technologies we have, someone who really has spent the time and effort and has gained the experience of listening to a lot of normal hearts and a lot of abnormal hearts yes. can, can listen to the heart yeah. and get a very good approximation, if not a pinpoint diagnosis of what's going on. That is crazy. If you've listened to uh, millions of hearts, I'm sure that if we can train machine learning algorithms to listen through oh. stethoscope data, a, yeah, then it, they can predict without even us needing to it's already yeah. happening. It's right? already it's happening. All that, Good. that kind of machine learning and identification of heart sounds is it's, happening. It's people are, are doing that. But your Fantastic. face, it, it's it's interesting because technology is also playing a role there. You know, before the best technology we had was auditory auscultation, right? To be able to discern, for example, if the lub dub, which we still haven't talked about. Yeah, let's the unpack lub, so, the lub dub. Yeah. Lub, so the lub dub is basically the sound of heart valves closing, okay? Yeah, yeah. And the reason those heart valves are important is because I mentioned there are these, there are four total chambers in the heart, yeah. two for each side. Blood has to go into the atrium, which receive the, the blood. Yeah. Then it gets squeezed into the ventricle. Ventricles, yeah. And the ventricle squeezes them out into their respective large Fast arteries systems. okay, okay? Mm -hmm. so if you mat if you if you imagine that you realize that every time these structures squeeze blood is either going to reflux back out of the structure unless there's a valve to stop it uh -huh, uh -huh. okay so the valves the two valves stop it four valves four valves because there's on the ventricles and the atriums they're on Both. the atrium and the ventricle to artery side yes yes right so yeah. lub is that first sound that is created when the heart, big heart muscle squeezes and the valves between the atrium and the ventricles close, those are the tricuspid and mitral valves, they close, uh -huh. all right? So lub, lub. all right? Now the heart is squeezing, wow. those valves are closed and the blood is being ejected into the aorta and pulmonary artery. So the, so the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve are open and that blood is ejecting out of those and as soon as all that blood that it's going to be ejected is ejected, the ventricle relaxes and the aortic and pulmonary valves close, and that's a dub. So you get this lub dub, lub dub, dub dub, dub lub, lub dub, dub, lub yep. dub. Right, so if you hear nice crisp heart sounds like that, you know that the valves are working well. There's no either narrowing of the valves or leakiness of the valves. Let me see if I can get this. So then the blood flow will lub into the atrium. Lub is as those valves, valves close, close, preventing blood going, refluxing, refluxing into the atrium. Uh -huh. And then the blood is there for, for, for a split second? For some time, not a split second, but for a, few sec for a second or two as the heart is squeezing mm -hmm. and injecting the blood out uh -huh. of the aortic and pulmonary valves and that's the dub that's the dub when they close and then and then and then it cycles again it cycles again oh, okay man, what an incredible it is pretty amazing. incredible wow but my so what i was getting evolution, at evolution we would have you know we just ne would have never thought of this if humans were left to like make their own heart if we just had no idea what was what a body was like if we were robots and we had to make a biological yeah. system we would have no idea how to make a biological well, well system what are they doing works. over at prelis so aren't it, they making it hard yeah. and organs and yeah, kidneys and stuff come yeah. on now if humans could organs. only we're getting there so yeah 3d printing is great it's wonderful so it's wonderful to be able to mimic the work of an artist if that artist is evolution so be it we can 3d print something that's already been entered into our consciousness but the quest to create an artificial heart has been ongoing since, yes. you know, since the, really, the inception of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. That's kind of the first big artificial heart. I yeah. think I saw an image of where you were using yeah, one. Yeah, in I, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. But even now... I also want to be sure that we have enough time to cover everything. So, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, there's never enough time to I cover know, I know there's not. Yeah, there's so many episodes. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the, um, the artificial heart, creating an artificial heart, 
has proved most difficult because there is nothing as good as the evolutionary product of the lining of the heart and the blood vessels to prevent blood from clotting. And all the artificial hearts that have been introduced uh, for human use are plagued by this. You can't create a material that prevents blood from clotting on its surface. So you may, we may have the energy technology soon where we can miniaturize energy sources and we don't have a drive line coming out of somebody that they have mm -hmm. to charge. We may be able to uh, get <clears throat> uh, parts that don't have fatigue, but one of the hardest things is being able to coat the insides of these artificial hearts so yeah. the blood doesn't clot in clot them. In them. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. And maybe, maybe the answer you know, will be some hybrid living surface you know, made mm. of tissue engineering yeah, yeah. on the inside of these, va of, of these uh, artificial hearts, yeah. that remains to be seen. But it hasn't proven as easy as, as one might have thought. But it's a very exciting field and it will help yes. with longevity. Absolutely. Yes. Let's, let's go on to the next one. So, uh, just God, to... One in four U.S. deaths. Yes. Uh, heart disease Jeez. is very, you know, it's one of the reasons I went into heart surgery, you know, I've, uh, I lost my grandfather to heart disease. Uh, I never met him, he was very young. Um, and actually people who are of South Asian extraction are, have a predilection to cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance. Um, so a lot of this runs in, in my family, it runs in many people's families it's very common, as you can tell, one in four deaths are somehow tied into heart disease. Uh, and it's a big problem. It's a big public health issue. And it's very costly. It's very, uh, it's very, there's a lot of suffering that comes from this process with family. And it, once, even once we do get past heart disease over time, there will be some other part of the biological system that fails. Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go again to the next one, Ron. Aortic stenosis. So the point here was what, is that heart disease is a very broad umbrella, so that covers a lot of things that can happen, uh, that can go wrong with the heart. So before, I remember, I was mentioning that the heart is made up of muscle, right? It's made up of arteries that feed that muscle. And it's made up of valves that keep blood flowing where they're supposed to go. And any one of those components can go bad, yeah. um, be yeah. affected by disease processes. So when the heart muscle goes bad, it's cardiomyopathy. So the heart itself, doesn't, this muscle doesn't squeeze as well, for example. When the blood vessels get affected, that's atherosclerosis. Uh, that's what a lot of people associate with heart disease, like, oh, I have heart disease, I've got blocked arteries. Um, Athero atherosclerosis. Sclerosis. And the other one was? Myopathy. Cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy, yeah. which yeah. is a can't, can't lub-dub as easy. Well, the heart itself, the muscle itself, either can't squeeze or gets really big and therefore can't relax to fill. Uh, so uh, um, okay. there's, there are a variety of things that can happen there. Okay. And then the valves themselves can go bad. So aortic stenosis is one of, the aortic and mitral valve are the most commonly diseased valves of the heart. And those are on the atriums? The, the mitral valve is on the, between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And the aortic valve is between the left ventricle and the aorta. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay interesting. So on the left, the... Mm, yeah. Mm. So aortic stenosis is, is very common. Um, and it's you know, part of this five million figure of uh, in five million Americans each year are afflicted with some kind of valvular disease. Yeah. And um, yeah. about 1.5 million people in the U.S. suffer from aortic stenosis. That's premature restriction of the aortic valve, yeah. usually due to calcium deposits. And we don't know exactly why it happens, but it's very common. And it's a pretty severe disease. When people start developing symptoms, about 50% of them won't make it past two years. So that valve Jeez. needs to be going 
you, you have to fix it. Wow. Yeah, it just makes me very grateful for every moment that I'm alive as well. <laughs> just because I've, we've had friends that have passed, that have been in their early 20s, and it's, uh, it can be quick, you can blindside family, and yeah, it's, uh, it's very crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very grateful for every moment alive. Let's go to the next one, Ron. Coronary heart disease. So this is the atherosclerosis I was talking mm -hmm. about. Um, you know, the, almost it's over 700,000 people every year have what we call a heart attack. And that's, in its most simplest f definition, it's heart muscle that is injured or dies because it doesn't get enough blood flow. Mm -hmm, doesn't get enough mm -hmm. oxygen. And the heart is one of those organs of the body, unlike the liver, unlike the skin, it doesn't regenerate. So once you lose heart muscle, for the most part, it's not gonna come uh, back, it's gonna scar down. And then that eventual scarring over time to the point where you have a heart attack. No, the heart attack is the initial insult. That's where you don't have enough oxygen delivery to these Muscles, muscles. Okay. Uh, muscle cells, and they start to feel it. So yeah, as yeah. the muscles start to get strained, they start uh, to break down a little bit, right? And they may be on the verge, we're like gasping, gasping, gasping for oxygen. And then either they're not gonna make it, in which case you've you know, had an infarction or death of the muscle, or oxygen comes back because somebody has stented them or they've gotten oxygen or you've slowed their heart down, you've slowed the, the metabolic demand of the heart down and the little oxygen they were getting is enough and they were ischemic or not getting enough oxygen for some brief period of time. All right, let's, do, let's go on to the next one, Ron. Oh, so uh, for some reason the yeah, that's a little off, uh, huh? Yeah, that, 13th century should be underneath of the. Well, it's, I think it's an animation, actually, but that's it's okay. an animation. It's not, yeah, but um, um, the formatting, it's okay. Okay. We just we we transferred it as a we transferred all the yeah. files as a picture. Oh, Sorry. I see. Yeah. So anyway, the, I um I I love history. I just find it very interesting yes. how people uh, figure these things out over time. And uh, is this what the initial model was? That we thought this is what this is William Harvey's uh, depiction of circulation from the 17th century my and, goodness and um, his um, you know he, he was he is credited with coming describing and de coming up with the uh, scientific explanation and the measurements required to just to explain how there are two parallel circuits, circuits. in the heart uh, one goes one goes to the lungs and one goes uh, to the to the body but if you actually look in antiquity of course this had been described much earlier I think if you go to the next slide there was an article uh, in the Lan Lancet in the 1970s which uh, you know described the lost works of Ibn Nafis who is a, mm -hmm. a physician uh, in the in the 13th century, who actually, uh, using the works of Galen, was a very famous anatomist in the first century. Wow. Um, uh, looked at Galen's works and read his writings and figured out that, you know, the blood wasn't just going from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart, but there were these two parallel circuits um, and described you know, what we know today as modern circulation, which then William Harvey kind of re-described, uh, you know, a couple hundred years later. So All you had to do was just carve people up after they died yeah. and start looking and, and yeah. drawing. Yeah, well, somebody had to do it. Somebody's, somebody's got to, I was going to say it. Somebody's, somebody's got to do it. Even, uh, <laughs> even Ibn Nafis, in his time, he wasn't really uh, the social and cultural environment was such that you couldn't, do dissections on cadavers. So he had to rely on, on what Galen had done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and deduce things from that. Ibn Nafis? He owes me money, I think. Ibn Nafis, yeah. Galen, 
All right, let's go on, Ron. Oh, thank this, goodness for the initial explorers. Just want to say yeah. thank you. Well, this is a whole, uh, you know, this was a whole historical perspective on how uh, modern cardiac surgery actually came to be, and one of the one of the modern miracles which allowed us to operate on the heart is the creation of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And do we have a photo of that? Uh, I don't have a picture of the bike. I, I may actually go to the next slide. I don't know if it's going to show up because of the. Keep going. Uh, one more here. One more. No, I don't think I have a picture of the machine. Keep going uh, a little bit more. No, that's. I thought I saw. No, go. Like, go back. Okay. No, this is just a schematic of how cardiopulmonary bypass works. Okay. Okay. But I don't think I have a picture. Should we maybe machine. at least show this for now? Sure. Oh yeah. Okay. But um, I don't think the the animation is working. But basically, the the cardiopulmonary bypass machine was invented by Dr. Givens, who um, wanted to find a way to stop the heart and operate on the great vessels to remove blood clots that could form and block blood flow to the lungs. At the time, it was a big problem because after surgery... You're trying any to stop surgery, the heart. Yeah, any type of, after any type of surgery, patients became very prone to developing blood clots. And these blood clots could go and cause life-threatening obstruction of the vessels leading to the lungs. So there was no good way to stop the heart, open up the blood vessels, take out these clots, and allow blood to flow freely. And um, Dr. Givens was a young surgeon. He was working at the Massachusetts General Hospital at the time, and Dr. Churchill was the chief of surgery there and said, well, I'm gonna give you some time and some money and you some research facilities, and you're gonna go figure this out. Yeah. And so he came up with the first viable cardiopulmonary bypass machine which was a machine that takes over the functions of the heart and lungs so that you can operate on them. And so this is an, uh, a couple this is of a valves. Mock-up. It's uh, they're pumps actually, they're pumps. they're pumps. It's a pump that passes the blood through an oxygenator that oxygenates it, right? And then removes CO2 f- from mm-hmm. it and also, you know, warms it and is able, you're able to modulate all the physiologic parameters of the blood and control the pressure with which it returns to the body. So you basically take over the function of the heart and the lungs. And so this is frequently used today now. It's a modern iteration of this device, yes. Without it, yeah. without it heart surgery could not happen, happen the way we do it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the basic principle is you put a tube into that right atrium or, or someplace to collect all the blood wow. returning to the heart. You send it to the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. Yeah. It then sends it back into the aorta. And then you can put a clamp on the aorta and stop the heart and then operate on the heart and do what you need to do. For a, how long, a couple minutes? No. The heart can be stopped safely for now uh, up, to, up to, I would say three to four hours is kind of the upper limit of what you want to stop the heart. You can you can put a clip on that upper aorta and you can stop the heart for it's not a clip it's a clamp but a yeah a clamp but and yes. you can stop it for a couple hours you and can. operate on it you have to you basically and it's, it's so it's not lub dubbing it's no it's totally still and flaccid it's totally still and flaccid that's crazy yeah and then and then the um co- the cardiopulmonary bypass yes is acting as a circulator um, of the blood so that it continues being oxygenating your Correct. body throughout that time. Correct. Because are you, you're still breathe, you're not breathe, you're not breathe, you are breathing or you're, well, no, you're the, out, you're, you're out, you're anesthetic. Obviously the, the patient is completely anesthetized. S- meaning yeah. you're not even breathing then no. in your lungs. Okay, so then the, so then, so then how are, so the oxygenation is happening through the column or bypass. Correct. Yeah, yeah, okay. And there's somebody else. This emphasizes a team-based approach to modern heart surgery. Uh, you know, you have a specialized uh, 
a person with a specialized set of skills known as a perfusionist running that cardiopulmonary bypass machine. That's right. That's the word right. for the perfusionist yes. is yeah. the one that handles the blood psych cycl cyclical blood here. Yes, okay. and you have a okay. cardiac anesthesiologist that's providing yes. anesthesia. Yeah. You have specialized nurses in the operating room that are assisting uh, getting the right equipment, getting the right sutures, you know, making sure everything uh, is available to the surgeon that needs it. You have a surgeon and then you have somebody usually assisting the surgeon, either another surgeon or a physician assistant, uh, because So surgeon, surgeon assistant, that's our 15 minute time. Well, let's make sure we get through as much as we can now. Surgeon, surgeon assistant, bunch of nurses, um, a perfusionist, anesthetist, anesthetist. anesthetist. Yes. Um, so there's uh, like six or eight people at least. The, yeah. Wow. Per yeah. open body that's happening. Yes. Wow. Okay. This, so this invention is a major pillar, major pillar Car yeah. The cardiopulmonary bypass machine was a major leap forward. And prior to this, people had done, you know, all sorts of heroic things to try to operate on the heart and achieved some success. But the modern era of cardiac surgery was possible because of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine bless that and bless our future innovations on top of it let's see what, what else we can yeah what else we can do with it all right next one around these pictures were blowing my mind when i was when <laughs> i was looking through this i was like the this is the craziest wow so there's you that's me yeah so that this is a this is um an operation where we're repairing somebody's mitral valve and that's the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle and the, um, there, there are in, in, in the modern era, there are different ways to approach the mitral valve. So this operation is actually done not through the front of the chest, but through the side of the chest, through a small incision. And uh, wait, let's move one slide. Wait, was that back? With two, uh, try, can you go in two slides back? Sorry, go back to, yeah, there this you. one right here. Right. So normally you enter in through the sternum. This is the traditional approach to cardiac surgery. It gives the best exposure to the heart and all the va vessels. Yeah. Um, and you, is there's a saw that you literally we, saw the We sternum. use a saw. We use a saw to divide the sternum gently and then um, retract it so we have access to the heart, yes. And then uh, at the end, then you put it back together and it, it you can put it yeah. back together with wires or wires. actually now um, there's a, there's a uh, zip tie you can use my um, god to bring that bone together we can just have a zipper and just unzip <laughs> and like play with <laughs> it inside <laughs> Frankenstein, <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> and zip back up yeah. okay all right and so now you were saying um, you were you're coming in from the side the That's other right. side Oh, this but side. Yes. So oh, a mini, in, it's a, it's, it's huh. called a port access or a mini, uh, a mini incision. It's an incision that's large enough that allows us to see and basically gives us a tunnel right into the valve that we need to fix. Right into the valve you need to fix. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the photos again, Ron. And then, all right. And then let's go to the next one. So this is a more traditional approach. This is somebody uh, who needed the aorta replaced uh, as well as uh, the, the valve, the aortic valve, and that entire section has been replaced from the beginning of the heart all the way up to here. Uh, this is the head over here, the feet are down there, that's the right ventricle and left ventricle next to it, this is the right atrium, and uh, that's what you're seeing there, that ribbed looking um, structure is actually a tube of what we call Dacron, which is uh, very similar to what you might find on, on a sailboat in the sail. In fact, that's the first aortas that were uh, replaced uh, was with sailboat material. Dr. DeBakey hmm. was out sailing and looked up at the sail and said, this is a good uh, ah. kind of material that I could use to reconstruct aortas and put it in the autoclave and put it in the human body and it worked. Huh. Obviously, things have come a long way since yeah. then. They can last longer, that are um, more it, robust. Th they last forever, these things, but they it's e they're easier to work with. They're more compliant. Uh, they bleed less. They bleed when you less. Put them in. Yeah. Uh, next one, Ron? This is uh, fixing a hole in a heart. Oh, my goodness. So on the left side, you can see that's a hole. 
um, underneath the retractor there the dark pictures don't come out so well but you can see there's a there's a big hole with yeah, a right piece here. of it's right here it's right here it's yeah. right there yeah. yeah right there yeah and um and we basically just uh, sew that hole up uh, using a piece of um, pericardium from a cow that's been treated. Whoa. It's like a sheet of flexible uh, biological material. And yeah, that's sewn, from a cow. Yeah, that's sewn into position. And it's sewn yeah. in and then, yeah. wow, and that heals the hole. Wow, when you have a hole in your heart, you must be feeling Well, you can have, many people walk around with small holes, but if you have uh, you know, if, if you have a hole that is causing a significant amount of blood to go in the wrong direction, yeah. then you obviously feel it. Let's go to the next one, Ron. Let's see here. Oh, this was an interesting case. That, that image on the left, uh, what you see there is a bullet lodged into uh, the left ventricle. So where, is, where? Where? That metal piece right there is this a bullet. One? Yeah, so that this tiny thing. That tiny wow. thing. Wow. So this was a young uh, man who's incredibly this lucky. Pad. So That's just, just a pad so sponge, sponge to rotate the heart yeah. up into our view. This is a young man who is, is very lucky. He was shot, um, and uh, the bullet lodged in in the heart, and we uh, we extracted it and repaired it. And wow. Did, did fine. You Whoa. saved his life. Well. You, the, the system saved his life, right? He was lucky to get emergency medical services there on time. They, yes. did, all, they did their job. He got to the hospital, into the emergency room. The docs and team did their job and then got up to the operating room and we did our job. So. Damn, that medical system, holy cow. We're very lucky to live uh, in a place where the medical system, you know, we works uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't, but more often than not, it works. And, and we have very, we're, we're, we're very lucky in a lot of places in the world. Somebody like this wouldn't have had a chance. Yes. So, wow. Okay. Holy cow. Yeah. It's so true. Um, yeah, let's see this. What's this? Oh, this is a case where we had to replace the entire first part of the aorta. So this is the feet of the patient. That's the head of the patient here. You can see that white Dacron material. Yeah, yeah. So the um, aorta has been replaced from where it exits the heart all the way around to where it um, starts to turn down and go into the chest downwards towards the feet. And the three, you can see these three little pipes coming out here, one, two, three. And those pipes are going to the blood vessels that feed your arms and your, your brain and your face. Whoa. Whoa. So that's the, you know, innominate artery, the uh, carotid artery, and the subclavian artery on the left. And the issue was that? Um, this woman had a um, large um, dilation of the aorta and aneurysm. That's a whole other subset of diseases we have not talked about yet. But yeah. these Give are a quick understanding yeah. of aneurysm. An aneurysm is an abnormal dilation of a blood vessel, usually an enlargement, that's due to a weakening of that blood vessel wall. Um, and uh, the blood vessel is Ugh. follows the law of uh, Laplace, basically, which is once the blood vessel starts to enlarge, the wall tension on that blood vessel increases in proportion to the radius of the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the vessel's gonna, the wall tension's gonna go up. up too high. Yeah. And it'll rupture. Burps, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. that's why it's important to identify uh, these, these problems and intervene on them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this was just more of a transition to, I remember you had wanted to talk a little bit about the heart and its importance from a cultural perspective. Yes, about, teach us about yes. that. Well, I, you know, I think even the Egyptians were, uh, you know, believed that the heart was kind of the seat of the human spirit and mind, mm -hmm. more so than, than the brain. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, obviously the connection between the heart 
pumping blood and needed for survival was made by, by, er, by early humans. And uh, before we understood how the brain works, uh, the heart was thought to be, you know, the soul, the keeper of, of the soul mm -hmm. uh, of, of, the, of the body. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, you know, imagine you were an early human uh, just coming into cultural consciousness and you kind of looked at remains and, and you saw, you know, this rib cage, this very elegantly designed protective um, cage and inside you know that the human heart sits there, uh, you would know immediately that it is of great importance. It's not like a pinky toe that's out there exposed to the world. Potentially even the seat of the soul and the brain is just perceiving the environment Indeed. and making these, mo the hand Indeed. moves and gets a thing. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. And not to say the brain, obviously, the Very brain valuable. was covered with not, yeah. just a, with not just a cage, but a complete calcium encasing known as the skull, right? Yeah. So that's exceedingly protective. Protect, it needs to be yeah. protected. Yeah. And the heart has the rib cage. Yeah. And then the sternum and stuff. But yeah. also the brain has the entire nervous system. Um, Correct. And the heart has the vascular system. Right. Yeah. And many people, some people have postulated that the reason many people are right-handed is because of the position of the heart. In other words, if you're defending yourself against a lion or a, oh, or a predator or another human, yeah. your You've left protect. hand is going to be over here to prevent an yeah. entry into the left chest. Part of the chest, yeah. yeah. And then that means that you're gonna, you're your right hand your is right going hand. to be what you're oh, using to defend so yourself. That's so interesting. And so, uh, <laughs> who, who knows, these questions. Yeah, yeah. Who may knows? never be answered, but, that but it's is, an interesting thought. That is so interesting. Yeah, I don't fight yeah. fair anyway. Yeah. I, I fight I, fair. I use a lead <laughs> pipe. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Um, I really hope we get answers to some of these questions. Um, I want to ask you a very couple quick questions sure. that we typically ask our guests on the way out. Um, first question is, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? No. I think the statistical probability of some other type of intelligence existing is, is, is pretty reasonable. And then do you think we're in a simulation? Well, let's put it this way. I have no evidence to suggest otherwise, so it's possible. Do you think that consciousness is localized in the body? When you speak of consciousness, are you talking about individual consciousness? Sure. I would have to say I'm still too much a man of science to say that it's not. So I would say, yeah, I think consciousness uh -huh. is localized inside the body. It's not to say that it can't be transferred with the appropriate technological means. Yes. Yeah. So, I am willing to concede that consciousness can exist outside of the body with the appropriate um, technological platform. But as of present, I think yeah. consciousness resides within, the, within, within our bodies. And specifically for you, because I think this is important to ask you, what about the percentage division between the heart and the brain in terms of where is the seat of consciousness more so? Oh, I, I think it's completely in the brain. Oh, you think it's completely in the brain? I don't think yeah. consciousness exists. There, there is each organ system, each cell has a, has a consciousness of its own, not in a sophisticated manner. I, I, I running some think. algorithms. Running, al running algorithms and running sophisticated algorithms and perhaps even encoding more than, you know, using DNA to encode deep-seated generational memory. There's yeah. some evidence to that effect. But I think the consciousness that we reflect as our own, that completely resides in our brain. Um, yeah. You know, and that's that's just based on my scientific upbringing and, and background. There, I have no I have no right, and I have no real uh, ability to 
argue on a, or debate on a spiritual level because that's not kind of an area which I feel qualified. But uh, as far as the science is concerned, I think consciousness resides firmly in, in, in the brain. What are the, um, the, what would you say is the future of heart technologies? So that's something we haven't gotten into, but I think, you know, ironically, a lot of the things that we're talking about today from a heart surgery standpoint, I think will have evolved into something completely different, and it's happening as we speak. A lot of the um, traditional surgical techniques to correct structural heart disease will be replaced by more and more miniaturization and minimally invasive techniques. For example, uh, one of the greatest advances that have happened that has happened over the last few years for treating aortic valve disease is the invention of an implementation of TAVR, which is um, transcatheter aortic valve replacements. And that is instead of having to open up the heart, stop the heart, cut out the old valve, and sew in a new valve, um, we are now able to use catheters and introduce the catheters into the blood vessels. Yeah, through the femoral artery. Through the femoral artery, artery, through the carotid artery. Wow. Through the axillary artery and put those wires across the aortic valve and basically shrink an aortic valve so that you can then deliver it like a, a train on a monorail. Yep into position and deploy it without really even stopping the heart. Wow, so we can deliver through the artery system, we can deliver a, um, a, a valve. A valve. We can, wow, and then and non-invasively, well invasively, but way less invasively. Correct. That's crazy interesting. Correct. And then what else would, would you say about the future? I think that the same will happen for mitral valves. It's beginning to happen. Uh, we're, we're beginning to make advances in that area. Uh, and it's very promising the way, way things are, are happening for patients. It's, in the world of medicine, these things are a bit siloed. In other words, heart surgeons are mainly focused on surgery. And these techniques that I'm now describing are, are performed by cardiologists. Uh, and ah. so you're seeing a lot of overlap of the two disciplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're seeing a lot, you know, now you're seeing people who kind of live in both worlds. Yep. Um, but I think the miniaturization will continue, the ability to perform what formerly were surgical feats with catheters and wires with minimal incisions and minimal downtime will continue to yep. be the norm. Yeah. And uh, as far as coronary artery disease goes, I think we're getting to a near limit of what we can do with stents. So I think the balance between heart surgery for coronary artery disease and stenting, we're kind of settling out. But the big change that will happen there will be on the medical front, in other words, medicine front. In other words, we'll be able to identify better what causes the disease, identify those people early, do interventions on a molecular genetic level that prevents them from getting the blockages in the first place. I'm really excited for that you know. preventative medicine future. Yeah. Um, okay, very last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Wow, that's a doozy, Alan. Let me think. Probably the ability of humans to have compassion and love for one another because that cause, that truly, in some ways, you see people act completely illogically sometimes and they act some, not in their, in their best interest, but in someone else's best interest. Yeah. Uh, and yes, there's, there are certain displays of altruism in the, in the animal kingdom, but in, in humans, uh, it, it, true altruism, I think, d does exist. You know, selfless compassion and love for others. And I think that is one of the most beautiful things uh, that exists. It seems to be one of the highest callings. Yeah of so, the spirit yeah 
wow, what an amazing show. Yeah, well. I mean, thank you. Thank you very much. So much for coming on to our show. Oh, it's been a pleasure and an honor. I hope, <laughs> I hope it's not the last time. Not at all. This is so interesting. There's yeah. so much to continue understanding about the human heart. Absolutely. And about how this amazing, how, how, it, how it helps us stay alive and how it has evolved with us over time and all of its nuance that you helped unpack today and how you help people in with their lives help save their lives and that's that's amazing work so we greatly appreciate you teaching about us and about the future of it as well so thank you again of course thanks everyone for coming on to the show if you guys had a good time go and share with two other people go and start teaching more people about the human heart and what you learned today maybe go make a video about it go write about it yourself don't just consume the content go create comment below with your thoughts subscribe join the family join the community start chatting amongst each other also, join us on Patreon, help us support this, help us grow it, impact more people. Maybe we can do a show around closer to the surgical office sometime. That would be crazy. Uh, that'd be super interesting to go and highlight a lot of the interesting medical equipment as well that's being used today and bring that to you guys. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for on our producer director. Much love everyone. Peace. <laughs>